Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, I'm looking at my base and thinking this base is coming together pretty well. We've got a few buildings, we've got a few farms set up, but something is missing. We need the connections between each of these things to really make it feel like this area is coherent. Because if you take a look at it from the air, on the one hand, you see all of the buildings, but... You don't see any paths connecting them up. There's a little bit of path work over here where I had that initial kind of step down from my starter house that then connected to the blacksmith's house because it just felt like the whole thing was a big winding staircase to a relatively small building. But now we have this massive storage building over here. We have the factory where all the mud bricks are produced and we have a couple of these other little satellite farms here and there, which could really use some larger structures built around them if they want to fit in with what we're doing over here. We've got the honeycomb farm right there. We've got the honey farm opposite the factory. And of course, over the hill, we now have this large scale plot based tree farm. And one of the things that can really help to flesh out your vision for an area and help identify where you need to build more structures and where you want to develop your world a little bit more is by laying out pathways between each of these things in order to basically tie the area together. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to start off by identifying where the paths need to go. And it's nice and easy to do that. You just grab a shovel. Anywhere there are grass blocks, you can, of course, turn the blocks into grass path. And that will make it fairly straightforward to plot out where paths go with a block that's easily removed and replaced if you want to get rid of it later. And it makes sense that around here, a few blocks out from the front of this building, so it doesn't feel like the path is crowding it, we're going to branch off the path in multiple directions here. It's going to go that way and it's going to go this way towards the factory and towards the farms and my two houses over here. Now there are a couple of obstacles that we will naturally encounter when we do this because there's going to be some terrain that just feels like it's sort of in the way of what we're doing and at this point you should give yourself a bit of license to reshape the terrain as you see fit. If you feel like there's an area that just juts out unnecessarily like this bit here, I've cleared that out so that I can keep the path relatively flat. And one approach to creating this path could be to keep it as flat as possible until you reach an area where it can become a staircase, at which point you simply add in a bunch of stairs using whatever block palette you decide upon, let's say stone brick stairs for example. You're going to reach a point where the stone brick pathway is going to give way to some stone brick stairs, and then you simply build the stairs upwards <laughs> until you reach whatever the next flat plane of land is. And that way you end up with a path that feels very linear and feels very organized. Could also feel quite urban for something which is so straightforward, like you're building around existing infrastructure, which is why a lot of urban environments have staircases and stuff like that, basically to get you up to an elevation where you're going to be able to cross over a road if you're on foot. But that's not necessarily the approach I want to take around here because the landscape is a bit more rolling, the environment feels a bit more rural. I'm not building a bustling modern city here, I'm building effectively a mix of stuff, but what has largely taken over is this medieval fantasy timber frame kind of style. The factory is probably the one thing that escapes that aesthetic slightly just because of the red brick and the chimneys smoking and the sort of slate roof and everything, but even that has moss growing up the walls and cobblestone and tuff. There's some stonework in there, there's even mud bricks in there. So I don't think that building a slightly more rustic looking path up to this factory is necessarily going to look out of place. So you can decide amongst yourselves there, but in the case of this world, I'm going to focus on a design that is a little bit more rural. And with rural pathways like that, we're probably not going to put in too many straight staircases like the stone brick one that I just built. Instead, we're going to focus on shaping the terrain a little bit so that each of the steps up can be a bit more gradual. Ideally, we want the terrain to naturally rise and fall by a step each time separated out by larger, flatter areas. And in that case, we may even be able to include some slabs to make a half block step up so that the path still feels a little more shallow in its incline. So one of the first things I'm going to do is grab some dirt and grass. I've got more dirt than I have grass, of course, because the grass is just skimmed off the top with silk touch. We're going to flatten out some of the terrain around here, but not by carving it down, but by building it up so that there are larger, flatter sections like this more frequently as we go up the hill towards the back door to my starter house. We also have the back door to the blacksmith's shop to consider, where I haven't actually put anything down here yet, but the idea was that this was going to be a place where you could bring horses in to have their shoes fitted or anything like that. And 
in a modern setting even, you would probably want a shallower incline so that vehicles like cars could get into spaces like this. Imagine you're building a parking garage of some kind. A car's not going to be able to drive up a 45 degree angle of steps, neither is a horse really going to be able to walk up and down that. So when you're designing pathways around your base, one of the things you want to consider is what type of transport they are really intended for. Are these pedestrian walkways? Are they roads that are intended to be used by cars? Because each of those will have a different level of ability when it comes to steep inclines. And of course there are some vehicles that might be able to drive up a steep slope, but the problem is in Minecraft everything looks like a staircase because the environment is made out of blocks, and even stuff like slabs are not going to make it look like the surface is especially smooth. So from the flat ground here in front of my storage room I've got maybe an 8 or 9 block long stretch here, and then a 5 or 6 block long stretch here, and it starts to condense a little bit, it starts to come together and be a slightly steeper slope, but I'm still leaving four or five blocks worth of space before the elevation changes, just to make sure that the road feels a little flatter. And one thing you might notice as you do this is that natural walls in the terrain begin to develop. Let's say here, for example, if I remove a couple of blocks down here, we could find that there is a flat area of terrain where it really doesn't make sense to convert the entire thing into a rolling slope of dirt. And in this case, we could set up something like a retaining wall, where we build a more solid wall here to hold back the dirt from behind there and prevent it from slipping down into this terrain. And suddenly, this natural divot here has been turned into something that feels a little bit more structural. And maybe we can branch a path off in this direction, maybe it can come out from here at a diagonal leading into this space, and it feels more enclosed than the road that takes you up to the starter house up here. Now these are going to feel like bold choices at first, because structurally this kind of cuts me off from just being able to hop up here towards my storage room from this area down here where we might build another farm or we might build another house. And trust me, I am notorious for building roads like this and then not really using them. Like, I will jump over walls, fly over stuff instead of walking around on the ground. But for the coherent nature of the area, for the fact that this is a base that's meant to look like a living and breathing environment, paths like this really are essential for completing the picture. So going back to what we were saying earlier, the back door to my basement in my starter house is clearly meant to be a pedestrian entrance. It sort of feels like the tradesman's entrance, there's not even a window in the door to indicate what's inside, so this is going to be more of a private area. So this naturally feels like we should have a more structured entrance to it, and make it so it's implied by the style that we're building in that this can only be accessed on foot. So while our main road can travel along in this direction, we're going to take a branch off that road, and it is here that we will actually put in a deliberate stone staircase. So it feels like this is something that you wouldn't drive a vehicle or a horse up, this is something that is going to occur at a 45 degree angle as somebody steps up to enter the back entrance of their home. Another retaining wall type of thing here can make this area feel a little bit more private as well. It's a little bit more developed, it's been built on, maybe there's like a little back entrance sort of porch area over here. We could even put in a couple of barrels and whatnot just to add a bit of detail here and make it feel like this is a utility area. It's just somewhere that people go to leave a few logs that are going to be chopped and used to fuel the fireplace inside or something like that. And that way, even though we built this house in the very early stages of the series, we can develop a little bit of the area around it. We can maybe Maybe add another wall along here, and that could even have a couple of steps in it that lead up into a kitchen garden or something like that. You know, we can grow a few crops back here if we want to, and once again, we can keep a little wall around the entire thing so it feels a little bit sheltered. And already from the air, these paths and connections make it feel like this area is a lot more coherent. It really starts to feel like the area comes together, comes alive, and feels more natural. Once we get up here past the starter house, the road is going to branch once again. We're going to have our path go to the right here so that we can use it to collect objects from the farms over here, and we can have it come up to this next layer, maybe go around the boundary of this house a little bit, and it can go up over this section of land so that we connect it to the land down below where we have our sheep farm and our crops currently, although I'm thinking about moving these sometime soon. One other thing you might want to consider when terraforming areas like this is to treat the land a little bit more like you are molding clay for some sort of sculpture, and instead of just erasing and flattening the terrain, consider taking these blocks and moving them elsewhere and using them to shore up some of the areas of terrain that you feel need it. Using the same technique as we used down there, we can maybe pull this section of dirt wall here back 
and we can build that up so it's a little taller and that can be another good spot for a retaining wall. This time we're going to make that one out of tough because I think tough feels really good as like dry stone wall. But in that I'm considering also throwing in a little bit of rooted dirt and maybe some packed mud as well as examples of area where the dirt has seeped into the stones even though it's not quite pushing through. So I'm going to build that up alongside here and this path feels a little bit more intimate since it's around the back of this person's house so we don't need to worry about it being too wide. We'll put the tough and the mossy cobblestone along the bottom of the wall here just so it feels a little more supported by those chunkier bits of material and the mossy cobblestone can represent where the grass here has grown up or some slightly damper sections of wall have left a bit of moss growing on the stones. Above that we can can put some regular cobblestone which looks a little bit drier than the mossy kind, a little bit lighter as well as though it's not quite been touched as much by the elements. But then here and there, let's say at the base of the wall here, we can add a little touch of rooted dirt there and maybe a bit of packed mud around it. And one feature I think always works really well with retaining walls, especially when you make them out of material like tough, is to round them off slightly towards the bottom and start another layer one block further back. We'll do the same on the opposite side here as well and this creates a shape that feels a bit more rounded so it's sort of sticking out here and doesn't feel just like a flat constructed wall because that's not the impression we're giving with these materials otherwise it'd be something a lot more formulaic looking like stone brick. We can also work a little bit of mossy cobblestone into the top of the wall here so that the cobblestone starts to blend with the grass around here and that feels like the beginning of a nice structural element that could even support another building up here on top of the wall and we'd have to figure out how to connect the paths to it but it can be a nice way of figuring out what the layout of this area is going to be and where your next builds can go. Once you start putting in these infrastructure elements, you can sort of understand where the logical places to build next are. And in the meantime, we can fill up the area behind this retaining wall with a little bit more grass and dirt. Now, when it comes to figuring out a palette for the path itself, we're going to operate on a couple of different principles. The first being the kind of road that we might expect to see around here. It's a sort of rural environment, but you'd still want pathways and roads to be made out of solid material. You know, you could have dirt tracks and, you know, we could use plenty of stuff like the path blocks that we have here already, mud bricks, packed mud, rooted dirt and coarse dirt, that kind of thing to make it feel like there were, you know, horse and cart tracks around here. But I feel like having a slightly more organized layout to the place because of course these areas look like they are fairly well constructed buildings. They sort of have that built to last feel and so I want the roads to feel built to last as well. One of my other considerations though is how much of certain types of material we have because I have absolutely tons of natural stone from where I've been strip mining for materials and looking for an area to build the slime farm. Likewise, we have a lot of cobblestone and we have a lot of the mossy variants of both cobblestone and stone brick. So what I'm thinking we're going to do is make a path that, like the bottom of the wall over there, has a bit of the mossy material mixed in to blend it with the grass on either side. We're not going to be making formalized pavements or sidewalks or anything like that, but we are just going to have a foundation of stone laid along this pathway so it feels like the pathway is a little bit more intentional and from that we can still leave the grass verge on either side so that we can blend in some of those mossy bricks and cobblestone around the outside and make it feel like the grass in the terrain has slightly overgrown the path but it's still functional and usable. So we're going to grab a couple of stacks of natural stone and cobblestone and from here we're going to start replacing some of the blocks of the path here with the stone blocks but we're going to be detailing this as we go so instead of leaving too many large open areas of natural stone. My preferred way of texturing paths like this is to avoid a situation in which it feels like every other block is replaced with a different material because then you get this checkerboarding kind of effect which can work in the right circumstances but for an organic feeling path like this it feels a little bit too deliberate. It feels like you are literally building a chessboard with some lighter spaces and some darker spaces. Instead we want the path to feel a little bit worn and natural and so I'm going to mix in a bit of andesite here and there and the way I like to mix in other materials is to think about the way a knight moves in chess ironically considering we want to make this not a chessboard but a knight will move one block forward and then one block diagonally and so you'll notice I built this pattern in here it can move diagonally and then forward or it can move 
forward and then diagonally, but you end up with this shape that doesn't feel as deliberate. This sort of broken up J shape is something that you can repeat and rotate and flip around and it can occur in a bunch of different directions and patterns without it being too noticeable to the eye. Now since we've started using this cobblestone around the outside we can mix in some mossy cobblestone, we'll maybe put a couple of pieces here and here and that will start to blend with the grass around here to make it look as though the cobblestone might continue in some directions but it disappears into the grass or make it look like the path nearby has been worn bare revealing some stone underneath. So while initially it looked like this path was going to mostly be made out of stone, in this case it's made out of a mixture of other stone blocks including andesite which merges really well with the natural stone. Another thing you might want to consider is leaving the occasional grass block intersecting with the path like this. So it's as though the path extends outside of that, but if we wanted to, we could move some of the natural grass here. Let me grab my shears. And where it feels appropriate, we can just put a piece of grass in there as though it's slightly grown wild around this section of the path. Meanwhile, in other sections, we can emphasize the straight lines of the path to make sure that it still feels very deliberate. And in addition to that, I might cut a few of these mossy cobblestone blocks into mossy cobblestone walls so that we can start some lamp posts around the outside and give the whole area some natural lighting. Let's say right here we want to build a lamp post. We can start the base of that with a mossy cobblestone wall. We can add a couple of dark oak fence posts on top of that. Then two more cobblestone walls and we'll dangle a lantern from below the second wall like so. And that feels like a rustic feeling lamppost. Feels nice and cozy for the style we've established in this area and lights the path nicely to prevent some mobs from spawning on the roads. We might also want to consider using some leaves around these as little roadside bushes, which can help to reinforce the mossy side of things here, can help to add a little bit of roadside foliage and maybe even form some more formal hedges around the outside of larger structures like this where it feels like they would have cultivated plants for a little privacy. Although in this case I might trim those back so they line up a little better with the entrance. There we go, that feels like we've got a wide enough spot for a path now. And I think leaves are really good decoration for extending the boundary of areas like this as well. Obviously the walls stop a few blocks out from the road but in between the wall and the road we can have a bunch of little foliage and detail like that to add Add character to the build and direct players in towards the entrance. So as far as paths go, I think we are on the right lines so far. I'm going to do a bit more work pathing out this area. We might extend it out towards the factory here as well. And if I have time, I might figure out where I'm going to have a path going up over the hill towards our tree farm. Hey folks, welcome back. So we now have a path, a kind of T-junction leading from the entrance to the storage room in a couple of different directions, and I think this all looks really nice so far. Obviously, we are by no means done because there are a lot of other places we need to connect up, and there are obviously ways in which we can lay this out to sort of forecast where we want to build in future, but we'll get onto that in just a second. For now, let me give you a brief explanation of what I've been doing over here. This path continues until it reaches this stage here, where we have a T-junction. It's going to go that way towards the farms, and this way we have a little smaller path, and like I said, just a, a smaller, more domestic feeling path coming back around the side of this house. But eventually that's going to lead down to these steps that are going to connect to the starter house and everything starts to become a bit of a loop. But that obviously sections off an area here where effectively we could turn this into more of like a tiered garden space or something like that. You see, every time we set up these paths, it effectively creates a boundary around an existing build that we know is going to be effectively the plot that that build is placed on, that build's property, if you like. And in the case of this road here, it actually cuts off this back area nicely, and I do love that kitchen garden idea. It just makes it feel a bit more enclosed and cosy now that there's a more formal boundary around the outside of it. We've also got a couple of other paths. We made this one leading up towards the door. I haven't done much else up here because I still want to arrange this area in a couple of different ways, but we have these steps leading up to it, and there's a smaller section of the path connected to those, which is clearly just intended for pedestrian access. Likewise, here between the blacksmith's house and the starter house, but connecting to this area here where I set up a walkway down behind the house to begin with, I have a slightly more dirt-based path. We've got some coarse dirt in here, some mud, some mud bricks, a little bit of rooted dirt around as well, and that all gives the impression that this is more of like a dirt path that's been trodden over time and maybe a shortcut that was used by the people who lived in these houses. So that while this road was never formally paved, it still kind of got a lot of foot traffic and that's worn down a groove in the dirt over time and that's what's led to this path being there. 
And likewise over here we have the path leading up to the stabling part of the blacksmith shop, but that's got a bit of podzol mixed in, a bit of dirt to imply that this has been both well trodden and maybe some dirt has come off the horse's shoes or the shoes of the people visiting here and that means it gets a little bit of mud in the path there, even though it's a more formal, wide path like the rest of the ones we've been working with. Out in this direction we've got this section over here, which just leads towards the factory on one side and towards the tree farm on the other, and it makes sense to me that I think the tree farm is just going to connect over this ridge of the hill, a little bit offset from the storage room. But that has left a fairly large plot out the front of the storage room here where we could arrange a variety of things. If you wanted to do like a little market square or something here, which would make sense considering this is effectively a warehouse containing all of the potential products that somebody could sell, we could set up a few market stalls out around here if we wanted to. That's just an idea that I'm throwing out there, it's not necessarily my plan, but it helps you consider what you could place in these plot out areas once you've got the roads in place. So I think roads are honestly a really effective tool for figuring out what you want to do with an area. Likewise here, I haven't done a road up to the sniffer enclosure over here because I'm fairly certain I don't want the sniffers to stay here. So while I could set up a road leading up to the pen, I think I'm going to save it for now and this road style is something I can easily replicate somewhere else if we want to take a road up through here and lead it towards something else. For the moment I've not connected up the honey farm or the honeycomb farm because I'm not entirely certain what kind of builds I want to place around these, but we will get to that in the fullness of time. But I think the coolest part of all of this is looking at it from the air, because now with the sun setting, the lamp light kind of lighting these pathways, you really get the impression that this area is connected. It feels a bit more like a community. This feels a little bit more like a high street of sorts, although that's not exactly what I have in mind for it, but it feels like a well-traveled road that connects up all of these different landmarks that we've built up in the area so far. And I really like that. I think that's a very cool thing for the area. And as you can see, the lampposts are doing their job at keeping these areas of light where mobs will stay away from this road because they're not going to spawn in this area as frequently. Now the lighting is not 100%, like right here by the storage room there are probably a couple of areas where the light dips down to zero block light. And so naturally we are not going for full coverage here, we're going for something that feels a little bit more scenic and a little bit more in keeping with the technology of this area, right? Timber frame houses with stone foundations, a little bit of cobblestone around still, kind of makes sense that we're not using super advanced looking light sources, we're using rustic lanterns for the whole thing. But this is part of the reason I haven't grid torched this area to make sure that no mobs will spawn is because I want to approach the lighting in more of a way that enhances enhances the vibe around here, enhances the scenery and the feeling that we want from this area without the entire thing just being lit up in a very sterile and straightforward way. And of course during the day you don't get to see the lighting in the same way, but you do get to see the road itself. And I think this is a really great way of tying things together. I'm planning on using this road style throughout this area, but this is of course not the only way you can plan this stuff. Like if your settlement is a bit more modern feeling, if you're trying to build something that feels a bit more like a contemporary suburb, you can consider using a variety of different materials like let's say black concrete powder. Black concrete powder is a perfect substitute for something like blacktop, like asphalt, like the kind of thing that your typical road in a suburban area is going to be made out of, or a highway, or something like that. And you can just as easily put in some white road stripes or yellow road stripes if they are more common in the region you're trying to emulate. But the thing you have to bear in mind at that point is scale, because naturally you want to have a stripe of road made of some sort of black material with the white material down the middle. But it is unlikely that whatever roads you're used to are going to have a one meter wide white stripe down the center. So you have to take some creative liberties when it comes to scale, and you're probably going to scale these roads up so that they are basically seven or eight blocks wide, maybe nine blocks wide, so that the strip of white in the center looks like it's marking out a lane to scale when you look at it from further away. There is really no getting around the fact that when you're on the ground the scale is going to look kind of awkward, but often that's not what we build for in Minecraft, because as I've said about the builds in this area, one of the reasons I'm building on such a large scale and one of the reasons that I haven't done too much interior work is because 
the majority of the time, I'm going to be seeing these builds from the outside. But that is where paths like this and this exterior infrastructure really goes the extra mile into making this area feel lived in. Hopefully some of that made sense, and hopefully it's going to give you some inspiration for how to work on the roads around your base area. I'm going to go ahead and do a bit more of this before we wrap up the episode. These paths and roads are just something that we will work on quietly in the background as we string together some of the other things we're going to build throughout the series, and they're going to be an essential key to making this world feel a lot more connected. Okay, I've now done a bunch more work on the paths around here. We have a path splitting in two directions by the factory, one going up over the hill and the other turning to this side where it gets a little bit more weedy and overgrown. I've left a bit of the natural grass in there, but it turns a corner and leads both to the factory entrance and a little way towards where we will eventually build a building around the honey farm. Another really important thing about this, one of the things that I really love about this pattern where you can do the knight's move, you can end up with a diagonal and then a straight pan. Right here, as you can see, I've got those straight patterns leading in the direction that the path travels, right? So effectively, they lend themselves to the direction of the path and the two wide the two wide sections are always moving forward along the path. But as you reach a corner like this, you can curve those patterns around a little bit. And these andesite blocks effectively go in both directions, kind of cradling where the corner is. And then once we've turned the corner, at this point, all of the two block sections go with the grain of the path. Like the andesite here, the stone bricks there, the natural stone there, the cobblestone here, all of them effectively travel with the direction that you're supposed to walk along the path instead of going horizontally across it, which gives the impression that this is the direction you're meant to travel and it keeps the path kind of feeling like it's in motion. Once again here I'm using that pattern to turn a corner and this section here once again is the same sort of pattern. It's andesite right there, stone brick right there, stone here and another andesite patch over here. I've done the same thing with the cobblestone leading into the factory. So that's one thing you can do with that pattern that's really helpful for guiding the player a little bit more is by making sure that the straight patterns inside those patterns always run in the direction that you want the player to travel. It's very subtle, but it does the job. Now, we get over to this section here, and this is a part that I'm thinking about revising, because if we're going with the idea, as I mentioned before, of this being a broader transport road where, you know, carts and horses and whatnot could travel along here, this is a pretty steep hill for them to climb. The natural topography of this hill sort of prevented me from taking any other approach because to make the path sections any wider, or any deeper, I would have to cut deep into the hill and we'd end up with a path that effectively started to feel like a tunnel after a certain point. I've also laid in this retaining wall here to hold up the grass of this hillside behind it, but I think we could do something a little different with this. What I've done so far is just split the wall into five block long sections and include an indent here, which is a convenient place for me to put this lamppost, but also allows you to indent every so often to add another feature just to break up the pattern of the wall and make it feel a bit less like a big flat wall. But the problem here is it doesn't feel entirely natural. This feels a lot closer to a really tall slope like the kind that we were trying to avoid when we flattened out the terrain at the beginning of this video. And I think maybe what we could do instead is what actually happens in real life when a hill ends up being kind of steep for a road or something to climb up. Typically, we avoid digging too many tunnels unless the mountain is simply too high to climb and you need to get to the other side of it nice and easily. Instead, the road will curve and it will wind up around the hill using some of the shallower parts of the hill in order to make its ascent. And so what we end up with is a looping section of road that's a lot easier for horses and cars to travel. I do a little bit of cycling in my spare time when the weather is good, and I would much rather go around a couple of bends, even if it takes a longer overall distance to get to my destination, than I would to travel up this enormous steep slope. The other factor I have to consider is that just underneath this ridge of the hillside here is the redstone for my piston door that we added in the episode about slime blocks. So that goes underneath where the road currently is, and we can't really cut into the slope here anymore, otherwise the road is going to be very visible once we start doing something with the inside of that area that's currently behind the piston door. So instead, we're going to come off the road about here, and we're going to start curving up around a slope that we can dig out a little bit here, since there isn't currently anything built underneath this, and we can curve the road around 
along this hillside so that it connects to the top of the hill with a much more shallow climb. Meanwhile, on the other side, I have connected this road up to some of the farms, and I wanted to show you something kind of neat about the intersection between these two buildings. There is a little bit of a gap between the outside section of the storage hall and the pumpkin and melon farm where you can actually see the road in the distance curving up towards where the kelp farm output is. And I think that's a really neat little touch that I didn't intend. But when you are planning an area like this, it's really cool to consider what's visible through the gaps in your other buildings, controlling these sight lines and maybe framing some sort of landmark or having a path there to imply that, yes, the player can reach that point on foot if they want to. This is kind of the way that video game designers will look at designing environments in their games. If you signpost to the player that there is a way to get somewhere, then the player is going to feel more emboldened to try that. If you played modern action games, you'll be familiar with the way that ledges get painted to show that you can climb up there or something like that, but these are much more subtle cues to the player, letting you know that the environment up there is available for exploration. So I'm going to work on the shallow climb over here. We're going to keep this footpath here as a shortcut and a reminder that I will probably just fly over the entire thing anyway, but honestly I'm really happy with how the paths in this area have come together thus far. And later with a little bit more work we have this path cutting into the hill and going around to meet up with the walking path on the other side. And I think that represents a much more shallow slope that would be a little bit easier for horses to handle if we're dealing with the technology of the, I don't know, era that we're working with, although I don't know if we're really sticking within a certain era given the brick of the factory and everything else. But I think this works out pretty well and also gives us a nice sized plot for some other kind of build, whether we put a farm here and build something around it, or whether we just turn this into some sort of residential house. I think it'd be nice to have a few more plots like this around the area, separated out by roads, and then we can just carve one of the roads into the side of the hill here to connect it up to the house, or maybe the entrance is over here or over there. We could even use this cutaway in the wall here as a way into maybe like a back garden of sorts, and then there's a back entrance to the house with something a little bit more private off from the walking path. I don't know, there's a lot of options. And I find that when you lay out roads like this, when you start to work on this stuff, it starts to inform your other ideas about the area in a significant way. It's also kind of neat looking at it from this angle because you can quite clearly see the path up there to the left, but the path up to the right, you can just about see the heads of the lampposts sticking out there. And I think that's kind of nice. The terrain can conceal the path as much as the path can become a feature of it. But either way, I think the biggest impact is what we can see from the air, where it really feels like some of the roads are tying the builds together. And that's really what I wanted to do with this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. So we're going to wrap things up there, folks. Thank you so much for watching this episode, and I hope this has inspired you to connect up some of your own builds in your world if you haven't done so already. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.